now we have to start behaving. Now, now you have to start behaving, Barbara. <laughs> I'm telling you, one of these times, Barbara I'm, I'm going to turn Jackson. the camera around on you, Barbara Jackson. <laughs> 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 so that everybody can see who you are. Who is this Barbara lady that's always causing problems in the background? <laughs> All right, Romans chapter 8 is where we are this morning, and, uh, uh, you know, we've had a lot of good discussions in Romans 8, but I do feel like maybe we've kind of got bogged down a little bit, so I'm going to try to pick up the pace so we can make some progress, um, and hopefully, uh, if not finish up the chapter today, maybe finish it up uh, next week. So, um, last week we left off uh, with uh, verse 15, <laughs> verse 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Okay. And so uh, we began to discuss uh, very briefly uh, the subject of adoption, but we ran out of time uh, as we were just getting into that. Now, uh, real quick, by way of review, who remembers the four types of children we were before we got saved? Before Jesus, we were children of who? I gave you four things. Gravity. And children of gravity. <laughs> depravity. Oh, depravity. Well, that's true. That, that wasn't one of the ones we mentioned, but we were depraved, no doubt about that. <laughs> All right, so remember there was uh, children of disobedience was one. Wrath. Wrath was one. Yep. Children of wrath was the next one. Got two more. Who remembers what two more were? Sin. Children of the flesh. And then you got this last one, because Jesus told the unbelieving Jews... Ye are of your father, the devil. Devil, Satan, whichever way you want to put it. All right? So before salvation, before Christ, children of disobedience, children of wrath, children of flesh, children of the devil or Satan. All right, so then the Bible says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Now watch this. The fact that we had to become the sons of God or the children of God shows that before Jesus, we weren't the children of God. Remember how uh, I mentioned that uh, uh, famous speech by uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, I have a dream that someday all of God's children, Jews and Catholics and Protestants, and he goes through this long list, you know, no disrespect to the deceased, but we are not all God's children. We are children of God through Christ Jesus. And if you don't belong to Christ Jesus, you're not the child of God. Now, in Acts 17, Paul makes reference to the fact that we are his offspring. And so we are God's offspring in the sense that we are direct uh, results of the creation and the creative act of God. Uh, so God made man in his own image. In the image of God made he him. Male and female uh, made he them, and so forth. And so um, we are the offspring of God as far as his creative act, but we are not his children as far as relationship outside of Jesus Christ. Ye must be born again. So when we get born again, verse 15, it says that we have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So by nature, we were the children of wrath because of sin. But God based on our faith in his son, has adopted us into his family. Uh, look over at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. I think we may have looked at this briefly last week, but I don't remember for sure. Um, Galatians uh, chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. Look at verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time came, was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive, watch it now, the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Okay? So there's that spirit of adoption that has uh, grafted us into the family of God. 
Um, look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, well, let's just start at verse 1 and work our way down to verse 5. Paul, and an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us. There's that strong, controversial word predestinated. We will get to that uh, later on here in Romans chapter 8. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And so, in our former state as unsaved pagans, Gentiles, lost without hope in this world, we were the children of disobedience because we had disobeyed the laws of God. We were the children of wrath because being disobedient, that made us subject to God's wrath. And then uh, we were children of the flesh because we had not the spirit, therefore we followed the natural inclinations of the flesh. And because of this, this meant that we belonged to the devil. We were children of the devil. And so then grace appears. Jesus Christ shows up as God manifests in the flesh. He goes to the cross. He dies a substitutionary death in our place. He pays the penalty for our sins with his own shed blood. And then he rises again the third day for our justification. Now salvation is the free gift of God by God's grace to any person that will repent and believe the gospel. And so that's what you and I did when we got born again. And as a result, we are no longer any of those things. We are now the sons of God. We are now the children of God. We've been adopted into his family, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. We have the right now to call God our Father. Before salvation, we had no such right. Now, we may have done it, but that doesn't mean anything. We had no right. You know, uh, over in uh, Matthew, uh, look at Matthew chapter 7. There's lots of people that claim God for their father, but notice what God says to them. Matthew chapter 7. A person may claim God as their father. That doesn't make God their father. Mm -hmm. Matthew chapter 7. Come to uh, verse 21. Matthew chapter 7 verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Now watch verse 22 very closely. Many, not a few, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now that's got to be, uh, in my mind, one of the scariest verses in all the Bible. There are other ones. But I can't think of a scenario that's any scarier than you having self-deception where you have deceived or tricked yourself into thinking that you know God when you don't only to find out at the very end, when there's no opportunity to reverse course and do anything about it, only to find out at the very end that he says he never knew you, depart from him. Because if you depart from him, where do you depart to? There's only one place. Yeah, there's, a, there's only one place. And it's not, a, it's not a good place. It's not a good place. And so, uh, you know, it's one thing for someone to say, I know the Lord. The real question is, does the Lord know you, and will he admit to it? Because this is a crowd that said they knew the Lord, but he said he didn't know them. And so there is such a thing as being religious, but being lost. And I think that many of our Baptist churches are full of religious people that know about God that do not truly know God. They've gone through religious motions. Sometimes they sing in the choir. They've taught a Sunday school class. They may have been on the deacon board. They, they may have done all these outwardly religious things, 
but there's never been a true conversion to the Lord Jesus Christ in their heart. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Pe um, uh, people can look at the Bible as a history book. They can look at it as a psychology book. Um, in the military, they can read the tactics yeah. of the Bible. I think it was General Patton that did that. He read uh, the military tactics, and then that's what he did with his troops. Was yeah, Stonewall Jackson did and, the same thing. Yes. And, I mean, it's not a religious book to everybody. Um, there, I think there's a picture I'm sure everybody's familiar with, and that's the Lord knocking yeah. on the door. But look at that painting closely. There is no latch outside that door. It has to be opened from the inside. Right. And, um, I he was, won't force his way in. Oh no! Yeah. No, he's, uh, but um, but there are different ways of looking at the the Bible. And then, as far as religion, I mean, my father and my my younger brother have a very intellectual look. I mean, they can tell you what verse is in what chapter, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There were uh, people at, at um, college that they wouldn't memorize verses; they'd memorize chapters and get up and recite that chapter. But um, what does that mean to you? Yeah. Um, when I'd learned the um, 20, 23rd Psalm, you know, early, uh, and, and then I recited it to a, a teenage, and she says, okay, well, what does that mean? Yeah. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's teenagers. It's, so, yeah, things like oh, that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the 23rd Psalm. Uh, you know, I, I remember a story I heard one time as far as there was this great gathering of, of, of people and there was a famous actor that was in attendance that was well noted for his gift of oratory. And so he was invited to come to the stage and to recite the 23rd Psalm. And so he went up there and recited it as elegantly and as professionally as, as someone could possibly do. And when he, uh, he received a nice round of applause and you know he came and sat down and afterwards, uh, uh, this uh, uh, old man that was sitting in the back with tattered clothes, he came up uninvited to the stage and he recited the 23rd Psalm. And when he was done, people were in tears and he went back and sat down and someone looked at the actor and said, how can you as a professional actor uh, not be able to move the audience the way this you know, unknown simple person that is uh, has done? And the actor said, that's simple. I know the psalm. He knows the shepherd. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. I know the psalm. In other words, I've, I've memorized words on a page, but it doesn't mean anything to me because I don't believe in the shepherd. That man, he knows the shepherd. And so it's personal for him. And so it always is a, a different matter altogether uh, you know, when it's a personal thing. And so, uh, how many of y'all have ever heard uh, uh, Philip Heron uh, give his testimony? A few of you, okay. Philip has a fascinating testimony because Philip was on staff at this church as a youth minister when the Holy Spirit of God finally got a hold of his heart and showed him that he was lost and needed to be saved. And we all know what a great man Philip is and all the great things that he's accomplished, but even in, in such a case as his, he went through all the religious motions, but he wasn't saved. And then one day, and I don't remember the exact circumstances of, of, of how it came together, but he eventually got born again for real. And so there are more people like that in church than we'd like to admit. Now, my purpose in saying all that this morning is not to try to scare any of you or, or make you doubt your salvation or anything like that. I'm not saying these things to say that. I'm simply pointing out a fact that there is a real danger and possibility of religious self-deception and you better make sure that you truly know God that you don't just know about God. You know someone has uh, remarked that uh, many people go to hell by 18 inches. Anyone know what that's in reference to? Yeah. The, the, the average human being on average there's about 18 inches from your, uh, from your heart to your brain and so there's a lot of people that have a, a head knowledge about God but they don't have a heart knowledge where they've truly been born again and received Christ. And so they go to hell by 18 inches. And so uh, I, God forbid that that should happen to anybody at First Norfolk. God forbid that that should happen to anyone, you know, in our life group or any other, uh, other life group, you know, within the church. You know, may all of us be diligent to 
preach the gospel clearly and plainly so that people have the opportunity to hear it and receive it and believe it. And so uh, verse 15 says that we have received the adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So God is our Father. Uh, verse 16, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, uh, the, the questions arise, you know, uh, how can I know I'm saved? And there are several answers to that as far as uh, how, how to know I'm saved. But this is one of the best ones right here. Uh, the Spirit itself... Here, uh, now, now, let me uh, uh, point out something here. Uh, the Spirit, who's that talking about? The Holy Spirit, right? It's, it, it's capitalized, right? Now, uh, in, in the King James, it says the Spirit itself. Uh, Michael, what's it say in the NIV? The Spirit himself. Himself, all right? So the question arises, uh, you know, as far as why would uh, one translation say itself or why would uh, one, another translation say himself? Uh, is... Is the Holy Spirit a person? No. Yes, the Holy Spirit is a person. There are three that bear record of heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Um, let me show you how the Spirit is a person. Come to Acts chapter 13. Look at Acts chapter 13. The Holy Spirit has the attributes of a person because he is a person. Look at uh, Acts uh, chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13... Look at verse 1, Acts 13, 1. Now there were there in the church that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Maenaean that had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Now watch verse 2. And as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said. All right? If someone is speaking... They're probably a person, right? The Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereinto I have called them. And so the Holy Spirit is a person because he's speaking and he says me and he says I. You're in Acts. Look back at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. Now is... Is the Father in heaven? Is he God? Yes, he is. Is the Lord Jesus Christ, is he God? Yes, he is. The Holy Ghost, is he God? You better believe it. Acts chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, they sold a piece of land, and I'm just going to make up the numbers because I don't know what the numbers were. Uh, they sold the land for $50,000. And now they've brought $20,000 to lay at the apostles' feet, but they're acting like they sold it for $20,000, and they've, they've given it all, right? When really they've kept back a secret nest egg for themselves. So they're trying to get the acclaim from the church. Oh, look how generous Ananias and Sapphira are. But really... What they've done is dishonest because they're acting like they gave it all when they have not right? And so uh, it says, verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to who? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, right? Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land. Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto who? God. God. So who did he lie to in verse 3? No, who did they lie to in verse 4? God. Guess who the Holy Spirit is. <laughs> so, so is that a play on words? I mean, you can say a, a spirit is a person, but a person doesn't have to have flesh. Well, you know, God is a spirit, and they that right. worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Right. And so a spirit doesn't have flesh. Right. You know? right. and, so a, you know, and so you can be a person, you know, as in the Trinity, Right. without necessarily having flesh. So uh, we talked about last week how we are made in the image of God, so we have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Well, God has three parts, body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Body, that's Jesus, that's the part you can see. Soul, that's the Father, can't see that. Spirit, that's the Holy Ghost, can't see that. But it's still three persons making up one God. You know, And, and that's the mystery of the, uh, of the Godhead, as far as that goes. But here's the thing, though. <clears throat> as far as the Holy Spirit being a person... He is a person. So when you come back to Romans chapter 8, you know, uh, who's, who's reading from the King James today? 
Am I the only one? Yeah, <laughs> I got on my phone. <laughs> All right. So the question arises, since the Holy Spirit is a person, right? Why would the King James here say the Spirit itself instead of like what the NIV says, the Spirit himself? Is anyone using anything else besides an NIV this morning? Or any, any other translation? What's the new King James say? What verse? Uh, it's uh, uh, Acts chapter 8, uh, verse uh, 16. Yeah, Acts 8, 16. I'm curious what... Uh, so let me... Uh, ready? Yeah, go ahead, read. So eight sixteen. for as yet he had fallen... Upon none of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Are you a Romans, brother? You said, you said Acts. Did I say Acts? I wasn't Romans. You're killing me. <laughs> <laughs> You're killing me, Holmes. You're killing me, Holmes. <laughs> right. 16. Yeah, Romans 8, 16. Yeah, 8, 16. <laughs> the, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. All right, so the KJV seems to be standing alone here. And so we, we've read from the NIV and we've read from the new King James. And that seems to be the only other translations we've got in the room. But all right. Paul has them all. Yeah, I give you whichever one you want. <laughs> what does ESV say? Show off. Whichever ESV. What's the ESV? English Standard Version. Is that like the Amplified Bible? No, it's uh, it's a revision of the new Revised Standard from 1952. It came out like in 2000 or 2001. Okay. The Spirit Himself bears witness himself. with our spirit that we are children of God. All right. <clears throat> oh. All right. So I'm pretty confident. Uh, for sake of time, we're not going to look any more up. I'm pretty confident, for sake of time, that uh, most of the uh, uh, of the new translations are going to say Himself instead of itself. Now, is Himself incorrect? No, it's not. And it's not incorrect because the Spirit of God is a person, so it's perfectly appropriate and proper to refer to the Holy Ghost as himself. Why, then, does the King James say itself? Well, it's very simple because the Greek word, um, let's see. All right, so the Greek word pneumatos uh, is what we call a neuter noun. So in Greek, you have gender, number, and case with regards to how words are translated. And so under gender, you have masculine nouns, you have feminine nouns, and you have neuter nouns. No, it's not transgender. <laughs> I've got good hearing, Becky. <laughs> that was Becky Cleveland asking if it was transgender. I'm just I'm throwing your name under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do sign language. Yeah. All right. So in Greek, words uh, as far as nouns and pronouns, like himself, itself, pronoun, right? <laughs> pronouns can be masculine, feminine, neuter. All right, so... In Greek, pneumatos is a neuter noun. It's a neuter noun. Therefore, it requires a neuter pronoun to describe a neuter noun. And so that's why the King James is more precise in that it has stuck with the literalness of the Greek that since this is a neuter uh, a, a noun, it requires a neuter pronoun, so they say itself. However, on context, because we know the Holy Spirit is a person, there's nothing incorrect about uh, the New King James, the NIV, ESV, whatever, saying himself. Now, um, I'm kind of like a literalist kind of guy, a, a kind of person, like as much as possible, I like to reflect what the Greek or the Hebrew is saying. So I think the King James reading is appropriate because of the fact of, of the neuter aspect of the noun and the pronoun. However, it's not to say that this is incorrect. I just wanted to explain that uh, because obviously, you know, I, I uh, preach and teach from the King James. And since it says itself, knowing that many of you have different translations, 
I wanted to make sure you understood why yours was saying himself and what I was reading to you was saying itself. Okay? So just a, you know, a point of clarification there. All right, so uh, verse 16, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And so what we call that is the inward witness, the inward witness. And so when you're saved, the Bible says that you have been born of God's spirit. You have been joined with God's spirit, and God lives inside of you through the person of the Holy Ghost. And so you have that inward witness that cries out, Abba, Father, that you are the child of God. And so a lost person doesn't have that inward witness. So when someone comes to me and they say, Brother John, you know, I'm, I'm really doubting my salvation. You know, I'm, I'm not really sure because, and, and usually without fail, nine times out of ten, it's because they've committed some sinful act and they feel very guilty about that. And so the devil starts playing with their mind and says, well, if you were, were really a Christian, you wouldn't have done that because Christians don't do those kinds of things. Uh, you might be surprised what Christians do. I mean, you go back to the Old Testament. I realize in the Old Testament they weren't Christians per se, but uh, what did uh, God say about David? Man after God's own heart. Man after God's own heart, right? And so here's a man after God's own heart that goes out, sees a woman washing herself, lusts after her, brings her in to commit fornication and adultery with her. She gets pregnant. When she gets pregnant, he, try, he calls her husband home from war, hoping that her husband will go lie with his wife so that it'll look like the child is, is uh, you know, his instead of the, the king's. And uh, uh, um, when Uriah won't do that, sends him, the front lines. sends him back to the front lines, carrying a, his own death certificate because he writes a letter to Je General Joab. Hey, uh, Uriah, give this to Joab when you get there. And so, uh, 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 Joab, uh, sir, uh, I've got this letter from the king. All right, thank you. Dear Joab, put this sucker on the front lines and make sure yeah. he dies. Uh -huh. Joab's like, okay. Uriah, I've got an assignment for you. Yes, sir. The next thing you know, Uriah's dead. And so here's David. He's committed murder and adultery. Do you realize that there were two sins under the Mosaic law for which there was no sacrifice? The law of Moses gave you, if you do this, then you need to sacrifice this. If you do this, you... murder and adultery, there was only one penalty for that the death penalty. And so David was subject to the death penalty for what he did. That's a man after God's own heart. So don't tell me that Christians won't do this and Christians won't do that. Uh, you might be surprised what Christians have done and what Christians continue to do. You know what I'm saying? We're not perfect. We're yeah. just forgiven. Now don't get me wrong. That I'm not saying that we have a license to sin to go out and, and do those types of things. I'm just saying the flesh is the flesh and if a person is not being led of the Holy Spirit, and if they're walking in the flesh, the Christian is capable of doing anything that a lost person does. Sometimes uh, Christians have less character than lost people. I know it's not supposed to be that way, but that's the way it is sometimes, you know? And so when someone comes down in their salvation, usually, not always, but usually, they, they've messed up somehow. They're feeling guilty about it. The devil's playing with their mind and trying to get them to think that, you know, well, you know, you must not really be saved because if you were saved, you wouldn't have done that. And so my question for them is this. Do you have the inward witness? Is there an inward witness? Uh, listen, I've messed up. A am I the only one in the room that's messed up? None, none of y'all messed up? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I bow before greatness. No. no, we've all messed up. We all know we've messed up. Sometimes we've messed up a little bit. Sometimes we've messed up a lot. But you know what? Even when I've messed up since I've been saved, there's still that inward witness, that inward witness of the Holy Spirit that lives inside that reminds me that I still belong to Jesus. And so do you have the inward witness or not? Look over at 1 John chapter 5 towards the back of your Bible. Uh, right before Revelation, you'll have uh, uh, 1 John 2 John, 3 John, Jude. Come to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse... Um, start with verse 9. 1 John chapter 5, verse 9. In verse 9, it says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. And so 
the witness of men, that might be what, what men say about God. So who, who's your favorite Christian author? Paul, who, who do you like to read from? Ooh. I know, I'll put you on the spot. Yeah. Who, who, who's got a favorite Christian author they like to read? I always like Paul. Well, I'm talking about outside the Bible. Yeah. Outside the Bible. Like whether it's, I don't know, I mean, you know. Yeah, I was say Luc a, lot, a lot of folks like Lucado, some people like David John Jeremiah. Piper. Yeah, David Jeremiah. Oh, speaking of David Jeremiah, my, my tickets for the Overcomer Tour came in the mail. Did y'all get y'all? Okay, all right. And uh, uh, Paul, Betty, do y'all still need some help uh, uh, getting those tickets? Okay. Uh, before we leave today, I'm going to look up the phone number for you uh, so we can get that number for you. What day is that? Uh, so it's going to be fourth. Thursday um, the 4th. The 4th. Oh. Thursday the 4th. Yep. All right, so uh, so you may read your favorite Christian author, and that's fine. But that's, look what, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, Max Lucado, David Jeremiah, John Piper, or whoever, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. In other words, the word of God is a greater witness and a greater testimony than any man. And too many Christians make the mistake of reading Christian books about God when they need to get their noses back in their Bibles and start reading about what God said about himself. And I'm not saying to never read a Christian book. I like to read books too, right? But here's the thing. You better make sure you're spending as much or more time reading about what God said about himself than what you are what some professional author may have said about God, right? So if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. Now watch verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And so uh, if you believe on the Son of God, you've got the witness inside of you. And who is that witness? Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. He dwells inside of us. Uh, he bears witness with our spirit that we are indeed the child of God. Uh, that's what it says here in Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. So I have peace and assurance for two primary reasons. I know I'm saved and my sins are forgiven for two primary reasons. One, the record of God, right here. And then two, the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me who bears record to the Word of God and to the record of God. Okay? That's the two primary ways a person knows they're saved. The Word of God and the Spirit of God who lives on the inside bearing witness to the Word of God. And when someone doesn't have either of those things, that's where real doubt creeps in. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so I'm a little confused. Back yes. to where it said that that he said he knew them not. Yeah. Okay. So you're telling me that those people, even though they thought they knew God, they mm -hmm. didn't? That's what he said. How could, how could you think you know God and you don't know God? Because you okay. go through enough religious motions that because of the things you do for God... And in God's name, how could you not know God? Like you take a person, I sing in the choir. I teach Sunday school. I tithe off my income. Um, you know, uh, I go to the soup kitchen and feed the poor. You know, uh, I volunteer time at the Boys and Girls Club. I help little old ladies across the street. I do all these things. Surely I must know God because look at all the things I do. That's works. That's works. And the Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, <clears throat> lest any man should boast. So here, here's the difference. The person who is doing works to be justified by God versus the person who does the works because they are justified by God. It, it, it's it, getting you a proverbial cart before the proverbial horse. But in the catch you know. twenty two, I mean, say you or, or or claim to be saved, but then not have any fruit. In other words, not do any of those things. And and, and that's the more common case is is someone who claims to be saved but 
there's just nothing in their life right. to back that up. But there is the reverse right. where that person, to look at them from outward appearance, right. and, and go, go back to the Pharisees of Jesus' right. day. I mean, they crossed every T and dotted every I as far as what the law of Moses required with regards to religious ceremony, function, and so forth. But you know what Jesus said? He said, you're like a whited sepulcher. Who knows what a sepulcher is? It's a tomb. Yeah, a sepulcher is a tomb. What's inside of a tomb? A dead body. So Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, outwardly, you're a whited sepulcher. You look gorgeous and beautiful on the outside. But then he said, inwardly, ye are full of dead men's bones. You look great on the outside, but God sees on the inside. You know, uh, over in Samuel, it says a uh, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And so my question for all of us, myself included, is when God looks on our hearts, what does he see? Does he see a religious person going through the motions trying to justify themselves by the good things that they do? Or does he see a person on the inside that understands the sinner that they are, understands that they can't save themselves, that they are fully trusting in God, and they do the good works they do, not out of obligation, but out of gratitude, being thankful for what God has done in their life. Yes, ma'am, you have another well, question? Just my only other comment. So yeah. In other words, where it says that everybody that calls on the name of Jesus will be saved. Right. So that, you stand behind that 100%? I do. But I take that verse in the context of another verse. Take your Bible. Well, first of all, let's look at your verse. Okay. Uh, you're in Romans. Look over at Romans chapter 10. Look at Romans chapter 10. And in Romans chapter 10, look at verse 13. Someone read for me verse 13. Romans 10, 13. <clears throat> for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right? So, Betty, that's the verse you're talking about, right? Uh -huh. you know, uh, uh, in mind, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Right? Okay? So, is that verse telling the truth? Absolutely. It's telling the truth a thousand percent. The person that calls upon the Lord shall be saved. Mm -hmm. But, let me put it in a clearer context. Come back to the book of Psalms and come to, uh, come to Psalms 145. Psalms 145. In Psalm 145, someone read for me verse 18. Psalm 145, verse 18. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. All right, brother, could you read it again? The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. Do you hear that last part? Truth. Do you hear that last part? The Lord, you know, in the King James, the Lord is nigh near unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. So, is Romans 10, 13 true? Yes, it is. However, are there people who have called upon the name of the Lord and they're still not saved? Yes, there are. Because Romans 10, 13 is taking for granted that when you call, you're calling in truth. But if you don't call in truth, God ain't saving you. I don't care how loud you call. Uh, over in Jeremiah, uh, I forget the chapter off the top of my head. I'll have to look it up for you. Ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me, when ye have sought for me with all your heart. It's Jeremiah 29. Is that 29? 13, maybe? Yeah, let's look at that. Thank you, sister. Jeremiah 29. Barbara strikes again. Yeah. Uh, make, sure, make sure you note that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah 29. Yeah, because we're always saying bad things about Barbara on, on, on camera, so we gotta uh, we got to make sure we give her credit, right? Let's see. Wow, I'm impressed. She, she nailed it. It's Jeremiah 29, 13. <laughs> Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Barbara will be teaching the class next week. <laughs> uh, and so you, got, you guys make sure that y'all come and, you know, uh, ha have your Bibles ready. And, you know, we're going to put her on camera and broadcast her, her, her to the world. <laughs> All right, so uh, Jeremiah 29, uh, uh, 12. Let's start at 12. Well, actually, let's uh, move back up to 10, 29, 10. For thus saith the Lord, 
that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. You see that? And so, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to them that call upon him in truth. And ye shall seek me, and ye shall find me, when ye have searched for me with all your heart. Now, let's go to a verse where someone calls upon the Lord, and God rejects them. I'm going to show you a verse now where God, uh, someone calls upon the name of the Lord and God rejects them. Take your Bibles and come to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Jesus uh, on the cross. So where are you, Father? Oh, yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Maybe that's yeah. different. Anyway, go ahead. Where are we at? Uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see where you're coming from with that. that that's not what I, what I had in mind. Right, I got you. Um, Proverbs chapter 1. Look at, uh, look at verse 20. Start with verse 20. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. There's a street preacher for you. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying... How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Now, in verse 24, things start getting really scary. Because I have called, and ye what? Rejected. Refused, rejected. I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. <clears throat> There's nothing scarier in the universe than the concept of God laughing at you in your time of trouble. That is the most frightening thing that any human being can comprehend. God laughing at you when you are in a time of calamity. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have said it not all my counsel with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When's the last time you heard someone preach on these verses? You didn't hear anyone preach on these verses. No, this ain't spreading love. <laughs> this isn't giving us Jesus the great big kiss in the sky. This isn't helping us feel good about ourselves, so we got to avoid verses like this, right? I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, watch verse 28. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me, for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and be quiet from fear of evil. Um, now you can say what you want to those are some frightening verses that's a side of God that exists and is just as real as the side that says God is love and nobody ever talks about it that's the end of the person who rejects Christ uh, that's the person uh, who has despised God and his revelation. And when it comes to a time where it's too late to do anything about it and they realize mm -hmm. 
wow, this was true after all. And they call out to God for mercy. He's not going to listen. Now, I can't say when that's going to happen for each individual. You know, uh, there are those who believe that, uh, that you can give yourself over to a reprobate mind. And what I mean by that is this, is that you reject and you reject and re you reject and you reject one time too many. And God says he's done and he stops dealing with you. And you might live for another 10, 15, 20, 25 years after that. But God's not going to deal with you anymore because you've crossed that line one time too many. Now, I don't know if that's the case or not. I know the Bible does talk about reprobate minds. And reprobate means unrecoverable. In other words, you've gone to a place God can't bring you back from that. And so uh, there are those that have given themselves over to a reprobate mind. And that's, that's a scary thing. And so uh, hopefully that kind of you know, answers your question that, yes, Romans 10, 13 is true. But there's a context to that. And there's another side of that that people don't very often take a look at. Is that kind of like the unforgivable sin? Well, the unforgivable sin, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, we discussed that uh, in, uh, in our men's group on uh, Wednesday night because we're going through the Gospel of Mark right now. And uh, the unforgivable sin, uh, that was the Pharisees accusing Jesus of casting out demons by an unclean spirit. So in essence, they were calling the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit. So it's not quite, uh, you know, the, the, the same thing. Uh, but that's what's often referred to as the unpardonable sin. Uh, is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And the way they blasphemed him is they said that he was an unclean spirit, that Jesus was casting out devils, but he was doing it by the power of a devil himself. And so, uh, you know, it's probably not a good idea to call the Holy Spirit an unclean spirit. <laughs> and so, yes, sir? I, said, I think God God can change, you know, obviously he can change anyone, but like you're saying, with a reprobate mind, um, as far as people go, He's always, I believe he's always chasing after us, but I heard, uh, it was Frank McGram's wife say very, uh, very eloquently one time where they were interviewing, it was like CNN an interview or something like that, interviewing her as a wife, like, why do you think all this, like, you know, we're going through all this pain, all the suffering, you know, all, all this stuff's going on in the world, why do you think that is? And, and she said, you know, we've asked God to stay out of our schools, we, we've asked him to, we're not, 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 we're, we're taking the Ten Commandments down here. We don't want to hear about it. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to yep. hear that. And God, being the gentleman that he is, has bowed out. And I thought, that's always stuck with me. And, mm -hmm. and like Jesus said, going back to the verse you were talking about, where he said, you know, other people were coming to him and say, hey, we prophesied in your name. We did this. We did that. We did this. The operative word being, we did. We were yeah. doing this. We were right. doing that. And he said, I never knew you. Uh, great, that's great. And I, I take that two ways. There's power in his name. You know, you may not know Jesus, but you can still use his name to cast out demons and heal and all do all the stuff. But you just knowing, him <laughs> yeah, knowing him intimately is different. And I think that's why, like for me as a, as, a, as a guy, and I know most men identify with doing things, fixing things. We, if we got that, we, we identify with that, we get purpose through doing a lot of things, which I think is why God made us the way we are. Because he said, you know what, you, if you're going to, you're gonna know me. You're. It's it's gonna be hard for you, but the dividends pay off. You know. Yeah. You're gonna struggle at it. You're gonna work at knowing me. You're gonna work at your relationships. But um, and I think I think that's why women have maybe not an easier time is the right word, but uh, they they're. The, I've always seen women just just being better at relationships and you know being connected with Jesus and showing that Jesus persona than men. But uh, but but when when a man's really working at it and you know you kind of see that you're like wow this guy's. He's on it, but anyway. Amen, brother. All right, so uh, let's come back to Romans chapter 8. Trying to make a little progress here. It's about time to wrap things up. We've got about five mm -hmm. more minutes here. Um, let's see. Verse 17. Verse 16 said that we are children of God. Verse 17 says, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if it, if it so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. All right, so uh, 17, uh, children then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. So when Amy and I got married, I already had a Navy Federal Credit Union checking and savings account. So when we got married, I added her to that. 
And do you know what her title is on the account? Queen Mrs. No, joint owner. My, my title is the owner because it's a credit union. Credit unions are a little different than banks. Yeah. The, what, did you, what did she say? What did she say, Mrs. <laughs> well, it, probably, it may say that too. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, when, when I opened the account, I was called the owner. I own the account. Mm -hmm. So when she got, uh, when I, uh, uh, she and I got married and I put her on the account, they listed her as joint owner. Now, what does that mean? That means that she can do anything on the account that I do. I can request a loan. She can request a loan. You know, uh, she can open it, or I can open an IRA. She can open an IRA. You know, anything I can do on that account, she can do because I'm the owner and she's the joint owner. And as joint owner, she has the exact same privileges on the account that I do. Same concept here because it says, and of children then heirs, heirs of God, and watch it now, joint heirs with Christ. So what does that mean? That means that whatever God is going to give to Christ, his son, we're getting that too. What a thought. When I was reading about this, it said that when Romans and Greeks um, adopted, their adopted children got the same privileges as their real children. Absolutely. And if you remember last week, we talked about that in some cases, the adopted child has more legal rights than the biological child because you chose to adopt that child. Whereas the biological child, that may or may have not been random chance. Maybe you weren't even trying to have children and you had a child, right? Uh, whereas that adopted child, you purposely went through a legal course of action to bring that individual into your family. Now, therefore, not only do they have the same rights as the biological children, in some ways they have more, right? So we've been adopted into his family, and we are joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Now, that, that can, notice that condition there. If so be that we suffer with him. You see that? If so be that we suffer with him. And so what that's referring to uh, is millennial inheritance. Like, you know, after the rapture and after the tribulation, Jesus comes back to the earth and sets up his kingdom for a thousand years on the earth. We are going to reign with him. But all things being equal, if Daniel is a super faithful Christian and Michael is like a mediocre Christian and then Paul, he's saved, but he don't do squat, right? <laughs> I should have picked up Barbara just yeah. to pick on Barbara, but I'm going to pick on Paul. And Paul just don't do squat. Let me ask you a question. In the millennium, do you think that their inheritance is going to be the same? It's not. It's just not. Remember the, uh, the parable of the talents? Be thou ruler over ten cities. Be thou ruler over five cities. O thou wicked and <coughs> slothful servant, right? And so our, we're all saved, so all three of them are going to be part of that millennium. They're part of Christ's family. They're going to get an inheritance but they're only going to get an inheritance based on what they've done to deserve that. So where do our works come in? Here's where our works come in. They don't play a part in our salvation, but they do play a part in what our millennial inheritance is as far as what we're going to do uh, as far as uh, in the millennial. Look over at... Uh, what we do here it goes in eternity. Yeah. Oh, I have a, uh, a complete uh, a brain lapse here. I want to say... Is it 2 Timothy 2? So, well, um... 2 Timothy 2. Yes, ma'am. That part, uh... I don't know if it's terrible. I guess it's terrible where you have the workers and the workers that start early in the morning. Mm -hmm. and yeah. The that come late. Is this kind of the long same? same. And, yeah. and, and they both got paid a penny. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. the one that started at the beginning of the day and the one that came in... Uh, at, at the 11th hour. Right. And so I would take that in the context as a metaphor of salvation and it's, it, 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 it itself. Yeah. 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 And so that, that's how I, I, would, uh, I would take that. Okay. Now here in 2 Timothy 2, uh, let's see. Come to verse uh, 10. 2 Timothy 2.10. Looks like this is the right spot. Um, therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake, the elect, of course, you know, the body of Christ, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. 
It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. That's talking about the millennium. And if we deny him, he will also uh, deny us. If we believe not, yet he abide the faithful, he cannot deny himself. And so, um, if we suffer, he will also reign with, or if we suffer, if we deny him, he will also deny us. That's not deny us as far as denying that he knows us. That's denying us as far as millennial inheritance, as far as what you're going to receive. Remember, we looked at the judgment seat of Christ and we talked about wood, hay, and stubble and gold, silver, and precious stones. The gold, silver, and precious stones is going to receive a reward. The wood, hay, and stubble is not going to receive a reward. And so we've talked about that uh, several times as well. And so, uh, but uh, you know, suffering with him uh, has to do with the sacrifices that we endure for Christ now. And uh, some, the suffering for some is greater than others. Let's be honest. In America, do we do very much suffering? No. No, not really. Did y'all hear about the, the Christians that were slaughtered in Nigeria? Yes. Over yeah. 200 of them? Yeah. Do you realize the news hasn't reported on that once? Right. Now, they were all over uh, the 49 Muslims that got killed there in New Zealand. Mm -hmm. They can't stop talking about that. You know why? Because that furthers their gun control narrative, especially since New Zealand now has outlawed those types of weapons, right? And so the slaughter of the 49 Muslims, that furthers the political agenda of the fake news press. But 200 Christians getting slaughtered by, guess who? Muslims in Nigeria. That doesn't satisfy the political agenda. So Fox News, CNN, you know, uh, MSNBC, name the network. None of them have reported once on that. That's the reason. Is it recently? Yeah, this, this happened in the last couple weeks. Yeah, two weeks ago. Yeah, the only reason I know about it is this different uh, friends have posted articles about it, you know, on, on Facebook. And, uh, you, know, uh, if it, you know, if it wasn't for alternate media and social media, there's a lot of stuff we would have no clue about. We would have absolutely no clue because the mainstream press has an agenda. It's an antichrist agenda. And they're not going to uh, uh, publish anything that furthers the cause of Christ. And so uh, I bring this up only because in America, we have no concept of what suffering is. Suffering to you and I would be if we got fired from our job because someone didn't like our Christian faith. You know, we, we would look at that as, as suffering for Jesus if we got fired from our job. Getting fired from your job versus getting skinned and burned alive are two completely different things, wouldn't you say? Mm -hmm. And so uh, we don't even comprehend what suffering really is uh, in, in this country. I do think this, though, and this is just me giving opinion here, that the more time that the Lord tarries, you give this thing another five to ten years, I have no doubt in my mind that there will be open persecution and hostility towards Christians in this country right here. Absolutely. Um, Donald Trump was a reprieve from God. Barack Obama had put America in the toilet, and Hillary Clinton was fixing to push the handle and flush us down the drain. God gave us a reprieve, and, I, I, and no, I'm not saying Donald Trump is a saved man, and he's certainly not a perfect man. I'm just saying that God gave us a reprieve through that man's election, but that man's not going to be in the White House forever. I don't care if he gets reelected and serves two terms. He'll leave eventually, and who knows what kind of person's coming in next, especially when more and more young people, because as we get older, we're going to start dying off. And these young people that believe in socialism and things like that, you bring in a socialist form of government, how well do you think Christianity is going to function in a socialist form of government? Oh, I don't know. Go ask Christians in China. Go ask Christians in the uh, in Russia and in the former Soviet Union and its satellites. Well, it'll all go underground. Yeah, it'll go underground. It'll all go underground. And, and, and it'll uh, what will eventually happen. You know, if this comes to pass, and hopefully Jesus comes, we never have to worry about this. But what what may happen is small groups like this, we won't be meeting in a public church building like we are today. We'll be meeting secretly in homes. You know, I saw a video on YouTube one time uh, of a, a underground church in China. And uh, in this video, 
the Christians in this video are getting Bibles for the first time. And when the box opens and this one lady, she lays her eyes on the Bible, she just starts crying uncontrollably. And it just made me feel so guilty because, you know, I collect Bibles. You know, it's just, it's my thing, you know. You know, Becky, she collects shoes and purses. I collect Bibles. <laughs> right? Obviously not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's Bible smuggling is like a, a real thing over there in China. You know, what they, what, what they often do is they will take a Bible and they will disassemble it. And you get Genesis 1, and then you get Exodus 1, and you get Leviticus 1, and then you get Numbers 1, and so forth and so on. And then next week when we meet together in secret, you pass off right. that page, and you get a page that you haven't read before. Do you realize how spoiled and how fortunate we are and in don't this country? Even read it. And don't even, hey, there you go, sister, don't even read it. They're in the Gideon. Yeah, don't even, don't even read it. You know, um, um, one thing uh, that the Lord has done for me this year, and I'm, I'm very grateful, and, I, and I'm not saying this to brag or to boast, but I'm saying this to try to encourage you. Um, last year, I was uh, inconsistent with my Bible reading as far as hit or miss. One day I'd read it, another day I didn't. One day I'd read it, two days in a row, and then I might miss two days in a row. And, you know, uh, you can make all the excuses in the world, busy, work, whatever. You know, uh, we've always got something going on in our house with our kids for sure. But nevertheless, um, one of the things that I determined to do in, in 2018, or 19 rather, was to be more consistent, you know, with my Bible reading. And by the grace of God, I haven't missed a day this year. From January 1st to the present, I've hit every single day, and here's how I did it. Before, I had unrealistic goals. Um, I was trying to read 10 chapters a day, and... 10 pages a day, or either or. Well, it was an unrealistic goal because I couldn't keep up with that pace. And then you miss a day, and then the next day, you're trying to read the 10 chapters from yesterday and the 10 chapters, now it's 20 chapters. Well, you miss a couple days, now you're 30 chapters, right? And so uh, it just wasn't very realistic. So I, I had a realistic goal this year, I wanted to read four chapters a day. And so uh, I uh, started with Genesis 1, read to Genesis 4 the first day, and so forth and so on. Now I'm in uh, 2 Kings, about to finish 2 Kings and go into 1 Chronicles. And so I've read about roughly 40% of the Bible so far. And um, I'm on track to be done by October. And then from October through December, I've got enough time, reading four chapters a day, to go back and read the New Testament a second time. And so that was the first thing, was a realistic goal. And then the second thing was this, is having a designated time. Because uh, I'm kind of a night owl, so now, after all the kids have been put to bed, if Amy and I have watched a television program, whatever, all of it's done, 11 o'clock, that's my time. And so uh, 11, you know, I realize that's well past the bedtime of some. But for me, that's my time to read. And every night, like clockwork, at 11 o'clock, I've, yeah, <laughs> I've been reading my Bible. And so um, the combination of having a realistic goal as far as how much I'm going to read with a designated time. Like, for example, uh, you know, when you work, you have a certain time to be at your job, right? When you have a, a, a doctor's appointment, you have a certain time to be at the doctor's. Set an appointment with God. And for you, 11 o'clock is not going to work. But maybe 7 o'clock will. I maybe do it in the morning because if I yeah. do it at night, I'll go fall asleep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. I'm not a morning person. And so I'm the one that's getting up at the last minute and scrambling trying to get to work on time, right? And so uh, mornings don't work for me. Evenings do. Whatever works for you. But if you do those two things, I'm telling you, it will help you become much more consistent, you know, uh, with your Bible reading. So at any rate, let's uh, uh, take a break uh, right there. Uh, Brother Paul, would you mind uh, closing us with a word of prayer, Brother? Lord, we just thank you for all you do for us, Lord. We thank you for all your promises. We just pray that many will come to know you, Lord. Yes. We thank you for this church. We ask for your blessings. We ask this in your name. Amen. 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 May the Lord bless you and keep you. And have a good week. Make his face shine upon you. How's it going?